Hi, I'm Patrick Scott. Welcome back to PLS 101, American Democracy and Citizenship. Today we're going to be discussing um, the federal judiciary. We'll be talking about the different court systems that we have in the United States, the role of the judiciary in our political system, and we'll also be focusing quite a bit on discussion of the Supreme Court itself. Now, um, as we mentioned in our first unit of material, the American political system is unique in many ways. Um, and one of those ways is the role played by the courts. No other nation grants so much authority and political power to the judiciary as much as we do. And though the judiciary, the courts, make often far-reaching decisions, the courts are certainly not absolute in their authority, in part because much of what they do requires the aid or assistance of others to carry out those decisions. Now, when we start talking about the, the federal judiciary and the federal court system, actually, um, and really all the systems in the United States, we're certainly likely to think most of all about the Supreme Court. Uh, yet, the Supreme Court is only one of over 18,000 courts that we have here in the United States. Most of the courts that we have here actually are state courts, and if we ever have any, any kind of interaction with a court, chances are it's going to be in a state court. Uh, those are the courts that obviously most often affect the average citizen, uh, not the federal courts and certainly not the Supreme Court, okay, as in a direct kind of fashion. But whenever we, if we pull, were, were to pull all the different courts and court systems together, Okay, we see basically that there are 52 separate court systems, one for each state, one for the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, and then one for the federal government. Now, there are obviously many differences from one state court system to the next state court system, but what we're going to do is focus on some commonalities that all court systems have. All of our court systems have, for example, what are called trial courts and appellate courts. Trial courts. What are, the, what are trial courts? Co trial courts are known as courts of original jurisdiction. These are the courts to first hear a case, whether that case is a civil case or a criminal case. The first court to hear a case is a court of original jurisdiction and it's often commonly known as a trial court. So what are appellate courts then? Appellate courts are a higher court that may reconsider a decision made by a lower court. Appellate courts have what is called appellate jurisdiction. So for example, a losing party may appeal their case to a higher court, to an appellate court. And the appellate court, it's important to understand this, will never retry the case, but instead, if it chooses, it will review the lower case record. Okay, in other words, the record of the lower court case. It will examine the case, case record to make sure that there were no flaws in procedures or uh, no flaws in terms of interpretations made by the lower court. So that's what an appellate court uh, would, be in, would, would be involved in doing. It's not reviewing or, I mean, or retrying the case, but simply reviewing the record of the lower court case proceedings, making sure that the laws were adhered to properly, that the judge, uh, if there was a sentence, gave the sentence within the guidelines set by statutes, for example, state statutes, making sure that there was no uh, flaws in terms of procedures, that people's rights were not violated by the procedures that were taking place there as well. So that's the idea between appellate jurisdiction and original jurisdiction. And there's some other useful distinctions we should talk about too at the outset. For example, Another useful distinction that applies particularly with regard to state courts is this notion of limited jurisdiction versus general jurisdiction. So at many state courts, they have courts of limited jurisdiction, courts of general jurisdiction. As you might understand, or as the, the, the term implies, limited jurisdiction involves trial courts that hear only a narrowly defined set of cases. So for example, traffic courts, uh, small claims courts. These would be considered courts of limited jurisdiction. General jurisdiction involves a broader class of cases covering both civil and criminal matters. Okay? So general jurisdiction may cover, cover, for example, probate matters, divorce, family court, juvenile. If all those were subsumed within the same court system, um, then that would be considered a, a, a court of general jurisdiction. 
And then there's also, I'll give you another, another useful term to think about in terms of the outset, and that's the idea of concurrent jurisdiction. And this is when a state and a federal court have potential jurisdiction over the same issues. Okay, so one example of a concurrent jurisdiction would work like this. Uh, let's say you have two different people, uh, two people from different states, and the, these two different people are parties to a lawsuit. And this lawsuit involves a, a, an amount of money greater than $75,000. In a situation like that, that case could be heard in either a federal court or either of the state courts. So one person's from Missouri, one person's from Arkansas. In this kind of situation where the amount of money involves more than $75,000, <clears> that could be tried in, in the Missouri state court, in Arkansas state court, or in a federal court. Now, of course, others can only be heard in a federal court, okay? This is the opposite of concurrent jurisdiction, such as a, as a violation of federal criminal law. Then that would be obviously only in a federal court. But now, if you have a situation where there's concurrent jurisdiction, it's important to point this out. Once a case is tried in a particular system, it can only be appealed within that same system, all right? So in other words, you cannot appeal a federal court decision into a state court. In other words, you don't like the outcome, so we're going to now appeal it in the federal level and, uh, and go move to the federal level and shop around. You really, you can't do that. Uh, you have to, you can only appeal that decision within the same court system. Now, once you have a case that has, a, like say for example, been appealed to the state Supreme Court, all right, then only at that point in time, it may be successfully appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court, but there's, even here, there's no guarantee. It has to involve a matter of federal law or some provision of the U.S. Constitution, all right? So you just, even then, you cannot appeal a state court decision automatically and assume that's going to be the, the, the U.S. Supreme Court will, will hear this appeal and accept this appeal. It has to involve either a matter of federal law or has to involve some kind of provision uh, in the Constitution that's involved, that's, that's a part of this. Now, let's look more, more closely at the federal court systems specifically, okay? First of all, there are specialized courts. And these are uh, courts of limited jurisdiction. These specialized courts include things like the U.S. Claims Court, the U.S. Court of Military Appeals, the U.S. Court of International Trade, and the U.S. Tax Court are all examples of specialized courts that have uh, that limited jurisdiction. Now, so we, we have specialized courts. Now let's take the main structure of the federal court system and let's work our way up. So we're going to start at the bottom here. At the lowest level, and these are the courts at the federal level, these are courts of original jurisdiction, the trial courts. They are known at the federal level as district courts, federal district courts, all right? Now, there are 94 U.S. district courts courts. Each state has at least one district court, okay? And about half of our states have actually more than one district court. Within each district, you have anywhere from 1 to 28 judges, all right, depending upon the size of the scope of the workload and, and number of cases and also probably the, the population of the state as well, obviously. Now, these 94 district courts hear trials in all federal cases, be they civil or criminal. Civil and criminal or, or cases uh, are heard in the, at the district court level. In terms of some, some numbers here, among all 94 district courts, there are currently 678 judges, federal judges, and that number changes periodically. Uh, but, but roughly, um, you know, almost 700 judges that we're talking about, federal judges in, in, these, in, particular, in this court system here the, at the lowest level. In terms of workload, all of the district courts each year hear a total of about 300,000 cases, okay? And the vast majority of these 300,000 cases are civil cases in nature, okay? The vast majority are civil in nature. Now, Besides the district courts, let's go up to one level, and this will be the first level of appellate jurisdiction. All right, these are known, these are appellate courts, and this, the, these appellate courts are also known as circuit courts in our federal system. The circuit courts, like the district courts, review both civil and criminal cases which are appealed to them 
from the U.S. district courts. Now, it's also important to recognize in, in, at this point as well that thing, just because someone wants to appeal a case to a higher court doesn't mean that the higher court's going to hear the case. Sometimes we automatically think that, oh, we're going to appeal the decision and then the appellate court is going to grant that decision. But let me emphasize that that is by far the exception rather than the rule. There are many, many more appeals uh, made or petition than those that are actually granted or accepted. And that idea applies no less here in the federal court system. So um, they review far fewer cases here as well. Now, in terms of the structure of the circuit court systems, there are 12 circuit courts. There's one for the District of Columbia, and then there are 11 other circuits spread out across the United States Almost if you looked at a map of the United States, it almost looked like um, vertical lines dividing up our country. And so therefore, each circuit covers more than uh, one state, in fact, a number of states. As an example, in Missouri and Arkansas are covered by the Eighth Circuit Court. Now, in this appellate, uh, uh, at, at, the, at this appellate level, there are 179 judges that are in the circuit court system. These courts tend to be comprised of a panel of three judges each, and each year about 50,000 cases will reach the circuit courts because the judges at that level have decided to grant the petition to review a case from the lower level. Now, nominations to judges in the district and appellate courts are made by the president with the advice and consent of the Senate. These appointments are interesting. These appointments are made for life, for life. These are lifetime appointments. And normally the president has the Justice Department involved in searching for candidates. And then there's a lot of interaction that takes place between the Justice Department and the Senate Judiciary Committee, which is the major Senate Standing Committee to deal with judicial appointments. Um, and uh, again, uh, when we talk about the different number of judges, the 678 at the lowest level and the 179 judges at the uh, next level, those judges do not leave office every time a new presidential administration comes into power. Again, these have lifetime appointments, but given that number of federal judges that are out there throughout the United States, there are vacancies that are occurring all the time just by, by the sheer number. Now, Individual senators can play an important role here, but generally uh, only those that involve appointments to a federal district court within their state. All right, now this is when the senators can play a role. There's a tradition called senatorial courtesy. And basically what senatorial courtesy means, it's an operating rule that the Senate employs. And basically what it says just is this. The Senate as a whole will reject the nomination of any candidate that's opposed by a senator of the president's party from the nominee's state. And that's a mouthful, but it's a very simple idea. So let's just say, for example, if President Barack Obama were to recommend someone to a vacancy in a federal court located in West Virginia, and Robert Byrd, the senior Democrat from West Virginia, who's also a Democrat, opposed this nomination of Obama's nomination, then the Senate as a whole would reject that candidate too. All right. Normally, in fact, it would not even come out of committee. Uh, the Senate Judiciary Committee uh, would just let the nomination languish there because the Senate Judiciary Committee would say, you know, Senator Byrd, here's a, here's a candidate that's been nominated for a federal judge position in, um, in West Virginia. Do you uh, oppose this nomination? And if Senator Byrd, in this case, opposed the nomination, then normally it would never even come out of committee. That's the way it, way it normally works there. They would just, uh, the action, no action would be taken until the nomination is withdrawn. All right? Now, I, I wanted to make sure that you also understand this. Why does it have to be a senator from the president's party? Why does senatorial courtesy only work when you're talking about a senator of the same party as the president? Well, let's take the opposite example. Let's say that we happen to have a senator from Missouri. All right, let's say in this case, Kit Bond. And there was a, uh, a federal district court appointment of, some, of a judge in Missouri. And let's say that Barack Obama, President Obama, 
wanted to appoint someone to, as a, to this federal judiciary and this district located in Missouri, we would not be surprised if Senator Bond, let's say that Senator McCaskill would support the appointment, but Senator Bond would oppose the appointment. Senator Bond might think that the, this particular appointee is too liberal because this appointee is a Democrat. Well, we would not be surprised, would we? We would not be surprised that the senator from the opposite party would naturally oppose the nomination. So the point here is that senatorial courtesy only works with respect as an operating rule when the senator is involved from the same party as the president. Okay, well that particular state we're talking about. They have to be at the same party. And so uh, that's, that's how that works. Now, um, though that applies to the appointment and nomination of district judges. Now, what about when it comes to nominating judges, circuit judges, judges for the federal circuit court? Does senatorial courtesy apply there? Now think about this. Knowing that federal circuits cover several states, then would it make sense for, like say for example, the Eighth Circuit, which covers a number of states, would it make sense for Senator Kit Bond to oppose a, an appointment, or in this case, I'm sorry, I should use Senator Claire McCaskill since we're talking about Democratic appointments here. Would it make sense for her to be able to invoke senatorial courtesy for a circuit cut court judge that covers a, 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 an area that covers more than one state? And of course, as you might think commonsensically, it makes sense that senatorial courtesy does not apply with respect to circuit court appointments. Senatorial courtesy, uh, uh, courtesy only applies with respect to federal district appointments. Okay, so make sure you understand that distinction. Okay, so now we have two different layers of the federal judiciary. All right, we've, we, we've dismissed with the specialized courts. We've worked at the bottom of the pyramid here with the district courts. We've now moved up to the level of appellate jurisdiction with the circuit courts. And now we have to deal with, of course, the next level, the highest level, and that is the Supreme Court. Does the Supreme Court have only appellate jurisdiction? And the answer is no. The Supreme Court, the vast majority of the work of the Supreme Court is naturally appellate jurisdiction, cases involving appellate jurisdiction. However, it does exercise original jurisdiction in some cases. Uh, if the case is involving a foreign ambassador, or those in which a state is a party to a particular case where the state itself is a party, then the Supreme Court may at that point be the first court to hear the case and in that situation the Supreme Court is operating or dealing with a case of a, you know, a original jurisdiction. But by and large, by far, the vast majority of its work involves cases of appellate jurisdiction. Now here's some interesting things about the Constitution. The Constitution says that the only federal court that has to exist, that must exist, is the Supreme Court. All other federal courts are creations of Congress. And what's amazing about that is the whole district court and circuit court system are created by Congress and Congress can get rid of them at will. Congress could theoretically pass a law tomorrow that says the only court that we have to have is the Supreme Court. Or Congress may choose to actually pass a law that adds another layer of appellate jurisdiction that says, you know, there's not only a, a circuit court, but there might be a super circuit court level before the Supreme Court. You know, again, that's a hypothetical example, but again, Congress can do this because that's within Congress's jurisdiction to do so. These lower courts are creations of Congress. Interestingly enough also, the Constitution says nothing about how many justices there are to be on the Supreme Court. Of course, we have nine justices now, and that's been that way for a while, but originally there were only six. Congress has the power to decide on the actual number of justices that sit on the Supreme Court. If Congress wanted to pass a law tomorrow to double the size of the Supreme Court, Congress could do so. Now to me, one of the most fascinating issues in terms of congressional controls over our federal court system is that Congress also has the power, not only in terms of creating or abolishing the lower court systems, all right, not only in terms of deciding the number of justices on the Supreme Court, 
but Congress also has the power to decide even the types of cases that the Supreme Court can review. And I say that with an exclamation point. It doesn't really exercise that power that much at all these days, but te theoretically it could, and there have been attempts throughout our history for the Congress to do this. In, in the past, Congress has done that much more actively. For example, after the Civil War, the Congress blocked the Supreme Court from reviewing Reconstruction laws. If you remember, after the Civil War, this is the period of Reconstruction, and it was characterized by Union Army occupation of the South, and there were a lot of laws that the Union uh, imposed, that the North imposed upon the South, and the Congress uh, basically restricted the Supreme Court from reviewing any kind of Reconstruction law that dealt with that. Okay, and since that time, um, there have been other attempts by members of Congress. Um, such as a uh, fa famous senator from North Carolina uh, who's no longer there, but his name is Jesse Helms. And for a number of years, Jesse Helms tried to uh, engage a number of attempts trying to persuade Congress to limit the court's jurisdiction in cases dealing with abortion and school prayer. Uh, his efforts were unsuccessful, but he's basically trying to say that the Supreme Court should not be involved in looking at cases involving abortion or school prayer. And basically what that would have allowed the states to do was to pass laws or Congress to pass laws and the idea is that that would hamstring the Supreme Court from being able to review those laws. All right. So potentially even if the Supreme Court may have felt that those laws may have been unconstitutional, using that kind of power would hamstring the courts from being able to review those because it would fall outside the scope of their jurisdiction. And that was kind of interesting. But again. The, the, the Congress has recognized the importance of the Supreme Court because of its power to engage in ju judicial review. Remember Marbury versus Madison, 1803. Its power of judicial review to determine the constitutionality of laws at the federal and state level, the Congress has been very reluctant to basically exercise that level of degree of power to circumscribe the cases that the courts can review or not review. Okay? And technically, beyond that, if Congress does not like what the Supreme Court has done, if Congress finds that the court has declared a law unconstitutional, it can propose an amendment to the Constitution. And for example, there's a very famous court case in 1989 called Texas versus Johnson that dealt with flag burning. And uh, when the Supreme Court issued that, basically what the Supreme Court said is that Burning the U.S. flag, desecrating the U.S. flag is a form of symbolic speech and therefore that form of symbolic speech is protected. Now you may find that desecrating or burning the flag is despicable, but regardless of that, Supreme Court said that the, 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 the flag is, you know, what it represents in terms of freedom uh, is, is, is that, that, uh, that symbolic expression is so important that, that the ability to express your disgust with the country is a symbol of expression of freedom, and that's what has to be preserved. And uh, at the time, George H.W. Bush was president, and he said that uh, flag burning is wrong, dead wrong, and he immediately uh, urged Congress to pass a constitutional amendment to um, overturn that decision. Now that amendment was unsuccessful. It never even, it has to require a two-thirds majority in both houses of Congress, it never even got a, got, it didn't even get a bare majority. Um, but the point here is, is that if the Congress is successful, and you know how hard it is to amend the Constitution, but if they are successful, in a lot of ways, this is a way Congress can kind of get around a, uh, a Supreme Court decision. Because here's, here's how it basically works. The Supreme Court makes a decision. The Congress and the states working together ratify an amendment that nullifies that decision, all right? So let's say hypothetically in terms of flag burning, we amend the Constitution that says you cannot burn the flag, all right? Well, then any future laws that deal with desecration of the flag or burning the flag or anything like that, you know, now the Supreme Court say that's, cannot say it's unconstitutional because now the Constitution as amended says you can burn the flag. So because the Supreme Court has to interpret the Constitution and all of its amendments as being what the Constitution currently says. 
So you see, the, see my point here is the way that Congress can get around the Supreme Court decision is to try to amend the Constitution. Often, much more often the case, they're not successful. But if they are successful, the Congress is now forcing the Supreme Court to now provide a new interpretation of the Constitution as that Constitution is now amended. All right? And now you have to look at in the light of the Constitution, a lot of all the amendments, including this new amendment, and interpret future court cases and future laws in light of that amendment. Okay. Now, um, interestingly, for much of the nation's history, the court was required by Congress to hear all cases that came to it. Again, that was kind of interesting too. If a case came to the Supreme Court, I mean, all cases that were appealed, the Supreme Court had to hear it. Uh, but in 1925, Congress passed the Judiciary Act in response to a lot of pressure and, uh, and, and pleading from members of the Supreme Court about the workload. And so in 1925, Congress passed something called the Judiciary Act. And this gave the court tremendous latitude in selecting the cases that it wants to hear. And it has, uh, since that period of time, exercised a lot, a lot of discretion in determining what cases it would choose to hear each term. Okay. Now, the president is uh, required to appoint justices to the Supreme Court whenever there is a vacancy, just like the president appoints and nominates people to the lower courts, the president nominates people to the Supreme Court with the advice and consent of the Senate. Uh, one of the most recent uh, examples of that is the uh, nomination of uh, Sonia Sotomayor uh, to uh, the Supreme Court being the first Hispanic uh, judge to be nominated to the Supreme Court. And if you may recall some of the discussions that were taking place between the Senate Judiciary Committee and uh, Republican senators who were minority members of the committee and, um, and, and, the, and again this, uh, you know, considered even though she's the first Hispanic to be considered to the Supreme Court, many people were concerned about the fact that she was too liberal and that was some of the, the issue and discussions that took place at that time. Um, but the bottom line is this, uh, and as with the, her nomination, basically uh, most of the nominees of the president are appointed. About 90, if you look at, again, look at the history of the Supreme Court appointments, about 96% of the time the president's nominee will end up being appointed. In only a few instances are the president's nominees rejected. The latest rejection occurred the, over 20 years ago uh, by a democratically controlled Senate Judiciary Committee, and that was a nomination of Robert Bork, under, by, who had been nominated by President Ronald Reagan. Uh, many of the uh, senators, uh, again, it was controlled by, by the Democrats, but many of the senators felt like Robert Bork's political philosophy was far too uh, conservative and restrictive, uh, and, and uh, therefore, and concerned about uh, women's rights as an example, and so uh, he, was, he was considered to be too conservative and his nomination eventually was withdrawn. Um, but if you think about this in this process here, of course, we also remember uh, back uh, uh, during the George H.W. Bush, the controversy surrounding Clarence Thomas's nomination. Uh, he was the African-American who replaced Thurgood Marshall of the Supreme Court. Again, reported, he was, he was uh, nominated by a Republican president a lot of uh, senators thought that he was too conservative, but others were concerned because there were some allegations of sexual har harassment. When he was uh, the director of the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, uh, there were some charges that a former staff person who, is now, who later on became a professor, uh, a law professor at the University of Oklahoma, Anita Hill, charged that while she was working for Clarence Thomas, he engaged in a num number of instances of sexual harassment. There were a number of hearings that were held uh, during that time, but he was eventually confirmed by a narrow margin in the Senate. But in any case, these examples underscore concerns about presidential nominees and, not, and the, the, the appointment because of the, the stakes that are involved. And there are many possible reasons for rejecting a Supreme Court nominee. For example, if the nominee has a prior hostility, or, you know, record of hostility of civil rights, uh, if the person has questionable uh, financial dealings in the past, uh, if the nominee has a poor record as a lower court judge, I mean, the judge has a number of opinions, and you can believe and, and imagine that once a president forwards the name of a nominee to be considered, 
there's going to be a lot of people who work on staff for members of the Senate who are going to be looking at the nominee's rulings, finding out what they can about that nominee's political philosophy and how they ruled in certain situations. And are they going to find, for example, is there a poor record as a lower court judge? Is that judge making bad decisions, unwise decisions? In the case of Sonia Sotomayor, uh, there was a concern about how, how she ruled on affirmative action. And in fact, there was one situation in which she, as an appellate court judge, actually had ruled on a case that was overturned by the Supreme Court in terms of affirmative action. Now, the overturn by the Supreme Court was the 5-4 decision, so it was a pretty close decision. But nonetheless, that was, again, some of the concern that people had brought into play, talking about, on the one hand, she, she tended to be too affirmative action. And here, here were some decisions of hers that was being overturned by the Supreme Court. So again, they're, 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 those are the things that spawn opposition. Uh, more importantly, I guess, if we were to wrap this in terms of sum these up, in terms of uh, reasons why you might reject a nominee, more than anything else, it's opposition to the nominee's legal philosophy. When you're looking at their court decisions, you are able to hopefully tease out what has been their judicial philosophy on these areas. And when they're going and testifying before the Senate Judiciary Committee during the time of their hearings, the senators are asking them about their philosophy. What is your philosophy about the Constitution? What is your philosophy about individual rights? What is your philosophy about balancing the rights of the citizen in, who's been accused versus the right of the police to protect society? And to say, in these court cases, how did you decide these kinds of issues? To give the senators a better sense of the nominee's judicial and legal philosophy. Um, so so there is, these are the kinds of things that are, are very important in terms of determining uh, whether or not there will be opposition to the nominee, to the Supreme Court. Um, as you know, like the lower level court, the federal judiciary at the federal district court and the circuit court level, Supreme Court appointments are also for life. So if the president has an opportunity to appoint someone, he's obviously going to try to place an individual uh, who has espoused viewpoints they're very similar to his, all right, political and, and, and judicial, and thereby, by doing so, ensure representation of his party and his views even after he leaves office. And this is why this can go on for years, all right, in terms of uh, the, the president's voice. And even, even if your president ends up, uh, you know, uh, uh, for example, when Richard Nixon passed away, hit one of his key appointments to the Supreme Court was William Rehnquist, and William Rehnquist became uh, for, uh, Chief Justice, uh, over time became Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. And you might say, even though Richard Nixon had died many, many years ago, for another 20 years or so, here was William Rehnquist espousing the views of Richard Nixon and uh, you know, Nixon's vision and philosophy in a lot of ways, many, many years after Nixon had left power and had left office. Um, and so again, that's why these appointments are very important. Uh, it ensures that people ha are espousing your views even after you've left office for many years after that. Um, and that's why the nomination is so important. Uh, so obviously you want to make sure that you appoint someone who's smart, who's bright, who has a very sharp legal mind. But more than anything else, you want to uh, appoint someone who's sympathetic and uses that sharp legal mind and philosophy that's sympathetic to your, your viewpoints. Now, having said that, let me also say this. Just because as a president you've appointed someone, there's no guarantee that that justice will necessarily adhere consistently to your views. Uh, David Souter, who recently stepped down and was replaced by Sonia Sotomayor, was appointed by uh, George H.W. Bush. And a lot of people were very disappointed in David Souter's rulings because it seemed to me that even though he was, uh, had, 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 had espoused a conservative philosophy, in many cases as a justice of the Supreme Court, he did not uphold that same philosophy in practice as a Supreme Court justice. Uh, even more dramatically, what, uh, as an example, was um, the instances where uh, President Dwight Eisenhower, who was, who was a Republican, appointed Earl Warren as Chief Justice. Earl Warren was also a Republican. And during his tenure, he became Chief Justice. And during his tenure, this is called the, Wa the Warren Court, when he was Chief Justice, and this is from about in the early 1950s to late 1960s, during that time, the Supreme Court became the most liberal 
in the U.S. history, in its history, it became the most liberal in terms of the court decisions, particularly in terms of protecting individual rights. And years after uh, Warren had been appointed, uh, some people were asking Dwight Eisenhower about his accomplishments as president and also as a general and uh, in World War II, and noting that uh, Eisenhower had done a lot for our country. And somebody happened to bring in up the issue of Earl Warren's appointment to the Supreme Court. And uh, so they, they asked uh, uh, President Eisenhower, well, what about that, that that's, uh, Earl Warren as a point, you know, that, that appointment of Earl Warren to the Supreme Court? What about that? And um, uh, it was, so, so it goes that, that uh, President Eisenhower, you know, changed his expression quite dramatically and said, that was the biggest damn fool mistake I ever made. And again, so again, there's no guarantee, the point here is that there's no guarantee that the person you appoint is necessarily going to be espousing your views the way you may have thought it would be the case at all. This is probably a good time to conclude our, our initial discussion of the uh, judiciary. Uh, in our next session, we're going to be talking about the workings of the Supreme Court. We'll be getting to some other issues about, for example, the arguments for judicial activism versus judicial restraint. And then we'll conclude our discussion with uh, providing some information about the Missouri court system as well. So this is Patrick Scott. We'll see you next time.